The thing I love teaching the most in a, in a bio, biological system is that first time when people really understand about DNA and how it works. It's real cliche, but so many students come to me and they say, I don't really get it. What's the difference between a gene and a chromosome and DNA? Which is bigger than which? Which is made of which? Um, and again, it's a bit of an old cliche, but I talk about it in terms of recipe books. So talking about the chromosome as a recipe book, and then each gene is a recipe within the book, and the DNA is the, <clears throat> the letters and the ink and the words that make up the recipes. And when you think of it as that, and you talk about each recipe book having a, a similar recipe book in a different colour. So for each recipe book, you've got, let's say, a green one and a red one. And then within those recipe books, you've got the first recipe might be chocolate cake. And in the green book, you've got the recipe for milk chocolate cake, and in the red book, you've got the recipe for milk chocolate cake with raisins. And so there you've got an analogy, which is what I love doing, is, is working with fun, silly ways of explaining stuff. An analogy to explain a pair of homologous chromosomes, two genes representing the same protein, but different alleles of the gene. And then the paper and the ink is the DNA that makes it, and the whole book is the chromosome. And then suddenly I see students go, oh, oh, so that's how it all fits together. And, Oh, so that's what a gene is. And then once you start talking about it in language that actually means something to them, so this is the recipe to make your hair curly, this is the recipe that makes my nose this shape, this is the recipe that you know, gives me funny knees, then actually, and they start to be able to apply it to their lives, then it becomes more interesting. So I think in science there's a lot of fear around something that's not understood. Even with adults I talk to in the pub, people who don't understand the conceptual difference between genes and DNA and chromosomes, but they may talk about genetic modification because they've read about it in The Guardian, but they don't actually really understand what's going on underneath. And I think that's where the fear in science comes from, is a sort of embarrassment to ask those basic, basic questions. Well, I think you have to start with the basics, which is that, yes, a gene controls a characteristic. I think getting that basic knowledge across in the first place is really important. But then expanding out from that to say, okay, actually, maybe two, three, 10, 20, 200 genes actually contribute to a particular personality trait or a particular characteristic, especially if you're talking personality or, as, as you say, sexuality or something like that. So yes, you've got to get the science, which is gene makes protein makes character. But then you say, well, what, how do they all come together? So if you've got 200 interacting genes and each contributes a tiny little bit to your personality, then how's the overall effect manifested? And then you've got to take into account the environment. So all these studies with identical twins who actually turn out quite different in, in characteristics that, that are also partly genetic based. So then you look at, you talk to people about the effect of the environment, for example, on height. You may be destined to be a particular height because your parents are, but if you're poorly, um, you have poor nutrition as a child, then you're not going to get there. So there's all these interacting factors, but I think it does start from a basic understanding that you, it comes from your genes, but then everything else comes in on top of it. I think you have to make scientific ideas really relevant. And I don't mean relevant like, oh, should you buy these genetically modified tomatoes off the off the shelf in Sainsbury's. I mean relevant to their everyday lives so that people actually start walking around the world going, oh, why is the rain falling out the sky? Why is the sky blue? Like really silly basic stuff. My favorite one is um, if you hear an ambulance going by and it goes nino, 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 nino as it goes past. And I always remember as a kid thinking that's really weird, it changes sound. And when I learned that at school that it's to do with the shifting of the waves and it's called the Doppler effect, I was just like, amazing. And now every time I hear it in the street, I'm like, wow. And, I, and when I'm teaching my students at home, I'm like, right, okay, there's an ambulance going by in the street, listen out. So it's about making it not just relevant to what we hear in the news or to what we um, read in the government or the whatever's going on, but, but relevant to day-to-day -day lives. So again, a physics analogy, because I, I teach physics as well, and I actually really love teaching physics. Um, it's like, you know, you're in the bath and you try and grab the soap and you can't get it, because it's not where it should be. Why is it not where it should be? It's actually sort of down there. And it's because of refraction, because the light rays are bending. But if you try and teach people, students or even grown-ups in the pub um, or on media shows, if you try and teach people about refraction and you make it boring and, and sort of technical, who cares? But if you find a way of, of making it something that people will actually come across in their day-to-day -day lives, like a rainbow, 
is dispersion or you know when the Millennium Bridge was uh, built and the Wobbly Bridge and people started walking across it in step sort of totally subconsciously and it started to resonate because everyone hit the natural frequency of the Wobbly Bridge and it just started to swing which is a perfect example of resonance and is again why some buildings fall down in an earthquake and others don't and it's not the tallest ones or the shortest ones it's the ones that hit the exact resonant frequency of the earthquake. So if you start talking about science in a way that actually gets people going, oh yeah, why does that happen? Why does a string vest keep you warm if it's got holes in it? That doesn't make sense. Surely the holes let out the heat. No, the holes keep the air in and the air is an insulator. And then you can start talking about the properties of, of thermal transfer, of heat transfer. And then you can start talking about why do birds fly? Well, okay, they flap, but what about when they're soaring? Why are they soaring? Why don't they just plop down? you say that to someone, they go, oh yeah, I hadn't thought of that. And it's like, okay, so those are heat currents, that's thermal convection, convection currents that are rising up through the air and keeping the birds in the sky. So if you start to make science something that people actually um, find relevant in their lives, then it becomes interesting and then that's your jumping off point. Um, my favourite biology one, just, um, which my, my dad got me interested in when I was really, really small, was about, uh, my dad's colour blind and I'm not, because um, it's much more rare in women. But I remember him telling me when I was really little, he said, I'm colorblind, but you're not, but your kids might be. And it doesn't matter who you marry, half of your children, if they're boys, half of your sons will be colorblind. I was like, what? But I'm not, and you are. And I don't get that. And it's, as soon as you start saying that to people, and they go, well, how does that work? And then you say, okay, right, so think of your recipe books, think of one recipe book from your mum, one from your dad, and then you go into the story, and then suddenly it's relevant. So you find something that someone has in their life. It may be colour blindness, it may be a genetic disease that they're concerned about, it might be a trait like ginger hair. It might be something that is relevant to them, and then you can find a scientific way of explaining it.